Hell of a week in the WCC, and we're going to talk all about it. Welcome into the unofficial WCC Hoops podcast. I'm Zach Farmer, and we saw Gonzaga go down. We saw St. Mary's uh, just pummel Santa Clara. Santa Clara gets the big win one night and then drops it the next. Uh, Pepperdine snaps a long losing streak. Lots to get to. Uh, first off, but before we go any further be sure to hit the subscribe button there on youtube and like and favorite on your favorite streaming channels we're going to have a little we're going to have a couple of different interviews uh we'll play a little bit of the uh, interview from with connor hope from heat check college basketball podcast that was on thursday following the thursday slate so a little bit on gonzaga santa clara and where the zags are right now from him and then also we'll have uh Head co- USF head coach Chris Gerlefson come on in as well, and we'll chat some USF Don's basketball as we go along. But first, I we can't go any further without talk, uh, talking about Santa Clara upsetting Gonzaga, 77-76. The win for the Broncos snapped a 27-game losing streak, stretching all the way back to 2011. Steve Nash and Dick Davey were in attendance for this game. The students uh, got Steve Nash replica jerseys from the 92 season. The, the team wore those jerseys. It was, they were, it was an awesome look uh, for the team, and the energy was just incredible. Talking with some of the people who were in the building said it's maybe some of the loudest, uh, loudest venues they've heard at all, um, and, of course, the, the loudest they've heard the Levy center be in a long, long time. There was a lot, there was a lot to unpack out of this game. Uh, what Santa Clara did well, what Gonzaga didn't do well. And we're, we're just going to start right there. And I'm going to start with Santa Clara and what they did well, because I want to do as much of like celebrating what Santa Clara was able to accomplish before I get to what Gonzaga didn't do so well. First off, Santa Clara was the aggressor. All night long. Uh, the, they dominated the glass in the first half. At one point, they led the rebounding total 26-8. Uh, to eight. Uh, They finished plus 13 for the game. They had a six-point lead at the half uh, and ended up going up by as much as nine in the second. This They looked really good. They were on the attack from, from the jump, and Gonzaga was able to come back, but... They were getting contributions from everywhere. Santa Clara got contributions from from Brenton Knapper, from Johnny O'Neill, Adama Ball, Christoph Tilly. Uh, you had Tyree Bryan really chip in a lot off the bench. Uh, five players in double figures for Santa Clara. Brenton Knapper was clutch. It seemed like every time they needed a bucket, he came through with a clutch three. He had 16 points, four of six from, from deep. Uh, Johnny O'Neill hit a couple of clutch threes threes down the stretch Adama ball anytime and I've talked about it all kind of all season long of uh, just what of uh, how important he has been and when he comes through in the most important games he came through against Washington State he came he came through against Oregon he came up big against Gonzaga just the other night 17 points six assists he had uh, he had the game winning layup there at the end, very similar to the Jalen Williams play against BYU a couple of seasons ago. And every time Gonzaga punched, Santa Clara punched back. And that I mean, says a lot about this, this Bronco group, says a lot about the Santa Clara team. And just the job that Herb Sendek has done to to really like put this program in a position to be competitive in these games. And we saw like the near misses a year ago, the near misses a couple years ago against Gonzaga. And they were finally able to get over the hump in this one. Yes, this is a down Gonzaga team. 
But I would say, like, as a team, like the Santa Clara team is also not has not been as consistent as maybe the teams of last year and the year before. And you could maybe point to experience on that front. But we've said it, I've said it a lot over the course of the season that the Santa Clara team is capable of beating anybody. Said it last week that the Santa Clara team is capable of beating Gonzaga. And they did. And and they had 18 turnovers and they still won. There were there was something that didn't go. Anton Watson scored 32 and they still won. And we'll get into because you can flip this around and we'll talk about some Gonzaga's well if this and that. But big picture for for Santa Clara. Again, in line with what we've what I've said all year. And I this also shows what they are capable of doing in Las Vegas, what they are capable of being in the rest of conference. Because if they can beat Gonzaga, they really can beat anybody. And yes, I know the Saturday game against St. Mary's was the exact opposite of everything we saw against Gonzaga, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But they've set themselves up to be again and amongst to fin- have another top three finish. They've been the third place team each of the last two years. This looks like a team capable of being right there again. And their next three, they do have an opportunity to start to actually build up that that conference record. Right now they sit in three and one. Their next three are at Pacific and then home for Portland and Pepperdine. Theoretically, on paper, that should be three wins that Santa Clara should be able to pick up, putting them at six and one before they see St. Mary's again in Moraga this time. And for Santa Clara, I think like that's it's putting again, putting yourself in position to have the to have a shot. Let's say even if they lose that game against St. Mary's, you're still sitting at six and two. One of the wins is against Gonzaga. You haven't seen USF yet. You will still have to see LMU one more time. So there are still some key games that are on the schedule. And again, like the one thing for a team like Santa Clara is to avoid the trap game and to avoid the pitfalls. And that that's where these next three, I think, are critical. If you take care of your business against Pacific, like they should, if you take care of business against Portland and Pepperdine, like they should, they're going to be in position to for the second half of conference play to really do well in position position themselves well for the conference tournament. I mean, again, it is wide open right now and the game between St. Mary's and USF on Saturday is going to, I think, start to point the direction of where these teams may go, where where the top top four may go. Because again, get securing those buys throughout the course of the of the conference tournament is key. And neither USF nor Santa Clara have ever been able to grab one of those double buys uh, in this tournament. So this is go- this is a perf- this is a season where it can happen that they can grab one of those top two seeds, and and maybe not have to play until Monday night. All right, so let's switch over to Gonzaga. And what went wrong for the Zags? Right out the gate, they just lacked energy. And that was pretty evident all game long. It really seemed, especially early, that no one but Anton Watson really wanted to be there. Uh, he had, Watson had 17 points of Gonzaga's 34 first half points. He had 32 for the game Amazing, amazing outing for Anton Watson. 14 for 18 from the floor, uh, six steals. He w- he was everywhere. Like that that was a player of the year type performance from Anton Watson. And we've seen that a couple of times uh this year from him. But where was everybody else? Because outside of Watson, the off Everyone else shot 18 for 49, 36% from the field. The three-point shooting was not there again. They were two for 20 from three. Santa Clara had 18 turnovers, but the Zags were unable to capitalize. Had only 12 points off those turnovers, 
and the points off turnover number ended up being a wash because Santa Clara had 11. 11 points off turnovers, I should say. Graham E.K. was in foul trouble. He only played 17 minutes, ended up fouling out, and he was largely ineffective in this game. In fact, late it really looked like they needed to keep him off the floor more because he was slowing them down. S- Santa Clara was really pushing the tempo, pushing the pushing the the envelope, and E.K. just could not get back into the flow of the game. Braden Huff, he was great off the bench, 14 points in 19 minutes. He didn't play much of the last eight minutes of the game, which to me is an interesting call by Mark Few because this it feels like that was a guy that you needed down the stretch, and we didn't see him all that much down the stretch. And I don't know if that's just living in minutes or that's getting Graham E.K. more time because he's the... He's the veteran player. But in either case, he Braden Huff had a really good game. I think he should have been on the floor way more than he was in that contest. And their depth was highlighted again as a problem. Watson, Ryan Emhard, Nolan Hickman all played 40 minutes in that game. Hickman did not shoot well. Nemhard came on late, but he missed a big free throw toward the end. And again, like, you don't, not, not going to bury anybody for a missed free throw because those things happen. But them playing 40 minutes per night against a team like Santa Clara. And yes, Santa Clara is a top, good top half of the WCC. But this does not seem sustainable. And it does seem like even Anton Watson, you could see him during the game, just bending over and trying to find, find his breath, trying to find some energy um, in that game. Cause he was just gassed by the end of that one. And I get the feeling that's going to happen again against USF. That's going to happen against St. Mary's not like that level, but like, there, this Gonzaga team is going to be tested way more than we've seen in years past. They've already lost to Santa Clara. They're going to see USF in about two weeks. They see St. Mary's the week after that. Then we really start to get into, they still have to see Santa Clara one more time, USF one more time, St. Mary's one more time. And those last three are all in a row. And that's another key factor into this. Of like, As we get deeper and deeper into conference play, Gonzaga better figure out somewhere else in this lineup, somewhere else on this bench that can help them out. Because right now, I don't see this as being sustainable with this group. There still isn't that. I still don't see where the leader is. I still don't see where this team has. They seem to be missing it at the moment. And this is... There are a lot of issues we can talk about with Gonzaga. This is not the Gonzaga team we're used to seeing. This is not... There's not the same energy level that we're used to seeing. And Ant- Watson's doing all he can to pot- to try to keep this train moving in the right direction. But a loss to Santa Clara does mean they are now behind the eight ball. Starting to look at big picture. Because now they still have to see USF, who very well could also beat Gonzaga in either of their games. They still haven't seen St. Mary's, and St. Mary's is starting to play its best basketball right now. And they and they will have to go up to Spokane in a few weeks. And and Gonzaga's resume right now, like still what they have in front of them, they still have Kentucky, they still have Santa Clara one more time, they still have USF twice, and St. Mary's twice. But the rest of their resume has done them no favors in the last week. UCLA lost to Utah by 46. Syracuse lost by 36 at number nine, North Carolina. And that's Gonzaga's best win. And they were net 80 as of Sunday. USC has started Pac-12 play two and four with losses at Colorado and Oregon State. The resume is not helping. And they don't have much left on the resume to help for a potential at-large bid. 
Their three-point shooting also has been part of the problem, and it has been a problem all season long. But it's also been bad, especially over the last eight games. Over those last eight games, Gonzaga has only shot above 28% from three twice, and that was San Diego and Pepperdine up at, up in Spokane. Overall in that stretch, the Zags are shooting 27% from three. For the year, they're shooting 31%, which, which overall is ranked 261st in, in college basketball. And that begs the question, is there an answer for this team? It Does the answer to their ills lie on their roster? Or is this finally the year that this team doesn't make the NCAA tournament unless they, they are the auto bid? Because right now they don't look like an at-large team. They don't have the resume of an at-large team. Do they have the talent? Absolutely. But do they have the wins? Do they have... You took Gonzaga's name off of their resume. As I know some... I've talked with a few people who have said that, oh, Gonzaga's going to get in just for the sake that they are Gonzaga and they are a name. If you took their name off the resume, are they in? I think the answer is a clear no. But is there an answer? So I'll replay some of the interview I had with Connor Hope, again, from the Heat Check College Basketball Podcast, and we dive into it a little bit on what what might be able to help Gonzaga moving forward throughout the rest of conference play. Like, I, Gonzaga just doesn't strike me as a team that can can get hot against good competition. We haven't seen it yet. No. Or get hot and stay we- hot. <laughs> Do you think there's any any chance that Gonzaga or Mark Few starts to utilize more of that bench? Because I know like that's very that's history would tell us no, he's never going to use the bench. He's not going to dig that deep into it. But is there a situation where his hand might be forced because it's just he's not getting the production out of the guys that are playing? It's shrinking, Zach. Like it's it's. He didn't trust Dusty, so Dusty didn't play the final like 15 minutes of that game. He yeah. didn't trust Braden Huff against some of the other teams <laughs> earlier in, in December, so he didn't play at the end of that game. Sure, Yo got more minutes in, like during foul trouble at points, but like this is, and I said it before the season, this Gonzaga team has no depth. People said, no, this is the deepest Gonzaga team. Mark Few generally runs like seven or eight guys out there. You're lucky if in a close game against a good team, you get six. Yeah. And, and this is the thing. It's like, we, yeah, it's like he usually only runs about seven, seven guys, but usually there's eight guy, eight and nine are capable of being in that rotation right, right now. It doesn't even look like that's, that's, that's not even an option. Like seven eight and nine eight. are not going to get in the rotation. Seven and eight are yeah. capable of being in that rotation. And seven changes, right? You usually, he usually gets six guys who can be yeah. out there. But it's one of those things where he has, what, three quadrant one right now, three quadrant one opportunities left. The first one of those quadrant one opportunities he has left is February 10th. The other two are February 29th and March 2nd. So like he doesn't even have the opportunity to be like, well, we lost to Kentucky and we still have all of these games left. We lost to San Francisco. We still have all of these games left. Let's try and change things up. Like, yeah, the, the chances that they get an at-large bid are 1%, but they're not 0%. So does he just continue to play until there's like no shot? But when there's no shot, it's so late in the season that he just has to continue what he's doing because he can't change things up with two two weeks left in the season. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, this, there's a lot of bad vibes this, coming out of this Gonzaga team. And like, I don't think it's from a... I think they genuinely like each other. 
Mm. It's just everything else seems off. You can find the full interview with with Connor on the YouTube channel. Uh, go ahead there, check it out. And we went over a lot more than just um, Gonzaga. We talked about Santa Clara and USF and St. Mary's and uh, really where like we are, where the conference is at this point. Uh, he was coming out of the, the Santa Clara Gonzaga game. He had paid a visit to the Levy Center um, and all of that. So be sure to go, go to the YouTube channel and check it out there. Also, I'm going to make this note, almost forgot to make this note. Uh, we will be do, I will be doing uh, Thursday, Thursday YouTube Lives after every after every WCC slate, at least for the next couple of weeks, once we get to that last week where it starts spreading out a little bit more, um, there may be a switch to the schedule. But for now, next couple of weeks, every Thursday, this Thursday included, uh, be sure to hop onto the YouTube channel and check out uh, the YouTube live after the WCC games on YouTube and also Twitch, Twitch as well. All right. After the Gonzaga loss. The AP poll came out on Monday, and as expected, Gonzaga was no longer in the AP Top 25. 143 straight weeks. 143 straight weeks of the Zags being in the AP Top 25 is over. It is the first time since March of of March 13th of 2016 that Gonzaga is not in the top 25. Nearly eight straight years in the top 25. The last time the Zags were not in the top 25, Obama was president. The Cleveland Cavaliers had not yet won a championship. The Cubs still had a 107-year, 108-year World Series drought. And Taylor Swift was only two years removed from her 1989 era. A lot has happened since the Zags were last not in the top 25. And I know some are starting to dance on their grave and think this might be the, this might be the end because they haven't looked good to this point. They look a shell of themselves. They lost to Santa Clara, but they haven't lost two in 12 years, 13 years. There's a lot to be a lot, a lot of questions about this Gonzaga team. And there should be, because this is not just not the standard that we're used to seeing. But let's be very clear about this. Just because Gonzaga does not look like the Gonzaga of a year ago or two years ago or three years ago, or six years ago, considering I can, I have eight years worth of top 25 teams to, to pick from. That does not mean that this team is still not capable of winning the WCC. That does not mean this team is not capable of still of running the table and, and winning in Vegas. This team has the talent to do all of that. But they are still looking for a way to figure out how they're going to do it. And even keep in mind, at this point last year, they, the Zags were kind of up against it. They almost lost at Santa Clara. They almost lost at USF. They almost lost at Pacific. Then they did lose to LMU. That all happened in January last year. Much like it seems to be happening now. What last year's team was able to figure out is how to rebound for, and figure it out the rest of the year. That is what last year's team was able to accomplish. Can this year's team? Maybe. Again, talent is there. It's a matter of fixing the problems that they do have. Can they improve their three-point shooting? Can they find the energy person on that squad who's going to kind of take command when command is needed to be taken? And that's and that's where Gonzaga has to look at the rest of rest of conference play, setting yourselves up again. I think their at large shot is shrinking and shrinking by the day. So it's play your best by the time you get to Vegas. Figure out what you need to figure out by the time you get there. And maybe just maybe Gonzaga continues 
the tournament streak keeps Mark Few's streak alive for for a head coach who has never not missed the NCAA tournament. So two nights after this Santa Clara Gonzaga game, Gonzaga had the rest of the week off, had the weekend off. Santa Clara had to turn it around and play the other big dog in the conference, that being St. Mary's. And there was a lot of confidence initially that going into this one, Santa Clara clearly shown they were capable of beating that caliber of team. They had proven it against the Zags. And it was a matter of could they do it again against the Gales at the Levy Center. And we found out very quickly that was not the case. They St. Mary's took a 9-0 lead out the gate. They were up 30 to 8 at one point in that first half, led by 29 after the first 30 minutes. Zero turnovers in the first half for St. Mary's. Uh, we could go down the list and I'll get to some of the numbers in a bit, but this this Santa Clara team just looked emotionally gassed. They were out of it from the from the get-go. They didn't look like that they had the energy to get back up. And this happens with teams that all over college basketball, not just in the WCC, but we see it a lot like when a team does play Gonzaga and uses all their energy to play Gonzaga. The next game might be the letdown game, might be the game where it, they just do not have it. And Santa Clara did not have it on this night. And part of it was St. Mary's just absolutely doing what they do best. They played incredible defense. They rebounded well. And they're starting to get contributions everywhere. And this has been now been going on for almost a month, month plus. They had 22nd, St. Mary's had 22nd chance points, 29 points off the bench, 17 from Luke Barrett, six rebounds. He is, Luke Barrett has been playing really well over the last month or so. Gustus Marshallonis, he had 10 assists, his second 10 assists game in the last couple weeks. They held Santa Clara to 49 points. And that's the fourth time this year they've held an opponent to less than 50. Aiden Mahaney, 18 points, 20, 18 points. In this game, he had 25 on Thursday against Portland. You could, I think we're at the point where we can now say Aiden Mahaney is back, truly back. He's in through the first four conference games, he's averaging 20 and a half points per game, shooting 52% from the field, 55% from three, which is the best in the WCC. This is starting to look like the St. Mary's team we thought we would see back in November. That preseason ranked St. Mary's team, we're starting to finally see them. They're 4 0 in WCC play. 10 of the last 11, they've won. They have jumped 20 spots in the net since January 1st. And they now, as of Sunday, they sit at 31 and 32 on Monday. And yeah, the Q3 losses to Weber State and Missouri State loom large. And they will continue to loom because those are Q3 losses. But St. Mary's, with a performance since then, has put themselves back in the conversation. Keep in mind, they still have that win against Colorado State as the biggest feather in their cap. They still have to play USF on this coming Saturday. They have already now knocked off LMU and Santa Clara on the road. USF at USF this Saturday. If they do get by that game and get a win there, that means they're already through the first half of conference play with road wins at three of the four best opponents you're going to see in, in conference. And we're also starting to see them pop up in some of the bracketologies. As Gonzaga has started to slip and slip and slip, we've seen St. Mary's start to make reappearances. ESPN and the CBS brackets have St. Mary's in. 
Uh, both of them have multiple WCC teams in the field. And for in the C and in CBS's case, it's St. Mary's and USF. There is no Gonzaga. This St. Mary's is starting to put it all together. It's starting to look like they have figured it out offensively because defensively it's been there all year long. And I did it again. I'm not one. I'm not going to put too much stock of, Oh, I did it to Portland. Oh, I did it to Pepperdine. Oh, I did it to this team. They went out and dominated a Santa Clara team who just beaten Gonzaga. And yes, this was a Santa Clara team that was absolutely gassed. Absolute was, had used all their energy against Gonzaga, but this is still an incredibly talented Santa Clara team. And they held their two leading scorers, Carlos Marshall Jr. and Adama Ball, to a combined five points. Five. Now, keep in mind, like Santa, St. Mary's has done this to Santa Clara before. Brandon Pajemski going over to Moraga only had eight points in that game. They've they have figured out ways to eliminate Santa Clara's leading score in the past. And that takes us to the big matchup on Saturday, St. Mary's at USF. Now, USF does have a game before that. They do play LMU, which is going to be a tough matchup for them as well. But it's going to be likely a it's a likely a Q1 chance for both teams. I know St. Mary's is not quite on that cusp, but here it is. So St. Mary's, this will be a Q1 game for them with USF on the road. USF is 42 in the net right now. 42, let me check. I think that was where I had them. Yeah, 42 in the net is USF. That is a Q1 road opportunity for St. Mary's. For USF, St. Mary's right now is on the cusp of a Q1, Q2. Even if USF gets... If USF gets the win, yes, St. Mary, uh, St. Mary's will drop down a little bit, but I expect, I suspect that they're going to make that up in the rest of conference play and probably end up still in the top 30. And if that ends up being the case, that's a Q1 game for, for USF. That's going to, that's a big, big matchup because it's going, this is going to be a little bit of a clash of styles. Uh, both have been really good defensively. But they do it in very different ways. I mean, and really, it's it comes down to a few different options because for because they both are incredibly good rebounding teams. For St. Mary's, is it is a collective rebounding effort where you see it come from Josh Jefferson, Mitchell Saxon. You see it come from Alex Dukas. Alex Dukas had I led the team in rebounds the other night against Santa Clara. You see it from Marshallonis. You see it from Barrett. You see it from all over this place. For USF, the rebounder has been Jonathan Mobo. In conference plays, averaging 14 rebounds a game. And he, he has been just, he just sucks up everything near him. Now, that doesn't mean that the rest of his rest of the team are not good rebounders, because they are. Like You have some really good rebounders on that team. It's just that you have one that is absolutely dominant on the boards. Uh, so this is going to be a fascinating matchup between these two teams, and just the matchup of who guards Mobo, because he is an undersized five. I don't see him necessarily being guarded by a Mitchell Saxon. This seems more like along the lines of he'd be guarded by probably Josh Jefferson, just the, just body type and matchup seems a little bit more that that would make the most sense. Um, because, because Mobo is going to be a playmaker as well. He's going to pl be inside outside. And yes, he does. He's not a guy who's going to take any threes, but he is someone who can attack the basket and make a play when he's needed to, which is all very similar to what Josh Jefferson does. Also in this game is going to be a matter of what we see from the matchup of these two guards, Malik Thomas and Aiden Mahaney. These two have been so good in WCC play. Aiden Mahaney obviously already mentioned that he's averaging 20 a game. So is Malik Thomas in WCC play, and he's shooting 56% from the field. Uh, he has been really good over the last month. He's been the starting lineup. 
for the most part of the last three weeks. He is, he's really come on strong as the season has gone along. He's gotten more comfortable. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about Malik Thomas with, uh, with Coach Kerlefson in a little bit. This this is going to just be a really fun matchup because it does seem that these two teams mirror each other in a lot of ways, but just have a very different way of going about it. We know that USF is going to rely heavily on the three. We know they're going to rely heavily on trying to play up-tempo basketball where St. Mary's is going to try to slow it down, drag it out, and really take advantage of of the glass. They they are the best offensive rebounding team in the WCC, uh, but USF has the best rebounding margin. Like this, the glass is going to be critical. Whoever, to me, wins the battle on the glass is probably going to have the probably going to have the edge in winning this game. Uh, both of these teams have. Both of these teams, I think, have shot well as of late. I think St. Mary's has really come on strong more recently and hasn't had it all year long. And USF has been the most consistent team, any, uh, any of the WCC teams all year long, offensively, defensively. And they haven't, no one has run away from them. Even in their four losses, they've remained close. The one that kind of got away from them was at Arizona State, but even that, it's like they ended up losing. I think it was by 11 on the road. They are 9-0 and at home. This is going to, this game is, is a great opportunity for USF because I think this is where it splits off. If St. Mar- if St. Mary's wins that game, St. Mary's will be 5-0 and They'll have wins over USF, Santa Clara, LMU. They will still see Santa Clara one more time before they see Gonzaga, but now they have put themselves in the complete driver's seat to to take the league title. And guess what? That is what the coaches predicted before the season. I know a lot of people were jumping up in arms before the year, especially a lot of the Gonzaga people, of how much of a joke that was. Doesn't look like as much of a joke anymore, does it? And on the USF side, if they are able to get this win, it does a couple of things. One, this is a St. Mary's is one of the teams that they have absolutely struggled with over the last 20 years. They are 3 and 23 against the Gales. Since 20, I think 2012 it is. And getting a win in the first game against the Gales would just do an immense amount for the confidence of that team to know that now they are capable of beating St. Mary's. And they won't see St. Mary's again for another few weeks after this. Getting a win against St. Mary's, I think, does a lot. One, not only for their resume, but also just the outlook of conference. Because then, assuming assuming USF can get a win also against LMU on Thursday, they would then be 5-0 and with a win against with a win against St. Mary's, with a win against LMU. They haven't seen Santa Clara yet. That'll be back half of conference play. They haven't seen Gonzaga yet. That'll be later in conference play. What it sets up is that USF becomes the driver of the league. And USF can set themselves up to to really almost be the team to be. Because right now, they again, they've been the most consistent. I think there is an outside shot they could win the league. I think it's still a little bit of an uphill battle because they haven't seen Gonzaga or Santa Clara or St. Mary's at this point. So a long way to go. But I think it would add, it's a, it adds a level of confidence that if you can knock off that team, much like Santa Clara could was able to prove on this past Thursday night, if USF can beat St. Mary's, it proves that they can beat anybody, especially this year in the WCC.
And for USF, there's a there's a lot to dive into here because there's like you have they you have a lot of guys who are playing really well right now. USF USF's best player, Jonathan Mobo, talked about him already. He leads he leads the team. Well, let's see. In WCC play, he leads the league in points per game at 22.3, rebounds per game at 14.3. He leads the league in field goal percentage at 74%. He leads the team in his fifth in the WCC in assists at 4.7 a game. He has been absolutely, to this point, the player of the year. I There should be no argument over, when you look at his numbers, and I know, like, who has he played to this point, but if he can do that, not to that, I don't expect to have 22 and 14 against both LMU and St. Mary's, but if he's in, but if he does what we've seen him do all year, and he's essentially a double-double machine against these teams, that goes a long way, one, for USF's chances in each of these contests, but also just to set him up of like he's clear he's clearly been the best player to this point in in the league. Malik Thomas already talked about him. He's been averaging 20 a game. Duido Newberry is another one that we started to see his progression last year, and now we're starting to see kind of like the fruits of that. Uh in conference play, he's been averaging 14 a game. He's shooting 69% from the field, 53% from three. Uh and this this USF team has so many interchangeable pieces. It makes them really hard to, to match up with to an extent because everybody can guard everybody on that team. They have a ton of six, seven, six, eight guys, all who can really guard like three through five you know, slew of guards who are going to be matchup problems. This USF team, again, they do have LMU on, on Thursday. They have St. Mary's on Saturday. Uh, they won the only meeting with LMU a year ago. And is USF capable of w- sweeping this week? They are. They absolutely are. Um, and I don't think there's going to be quite the l- letdown that maybe Santa Clara had because LMU is not Gonzaga. You're not, you know, it's not the emotional up that, that Gonzaga is, obviously. So they can go in and handle business against LMU. There's a very good chance they can. They can knock off St. Mary's on Saturday. All right, before I go any further and talk about that, let's get um, USF head coach Chris Gerlefson in here, and we'll ask him about, about this week, the way he looks at his team at this moment, and what we're looking at this week. All right, I'm happy to bring on San Francisco head coach Chris Gerlefson. Uh, USF is 14 and four right now. Six, have won six in a row and have started WCC playoff three and zero. Oh. Uh, but before we get into all of that, I got to ask you about your Eagles tonight against the Bucks and how you feeling about that. Man, you're gonna hit me with that to start the interview. <laughs> um, man, I'm uh, I'm I'm confident, but the way we've been playing the last uh, the last few weeks, I don't know. We're we're a little banged up, but it's playoff time. Anything can happen. So. Uh, definitely looking forward to trying to tap into the game tonight. Yeah, should should be a good one tonight. Uh, so with your with your team, th- there have been so many developments. I think over the last like few months well, since the last time we spoke on air, and one of the things that has jumped out to me over the last month or so has been the play of Malik Thomas and just his development and how he has become more of a more of a reliable source on the offensive end and even on the defensive end. Just kind of talk about his development and what you've seen from him as the season has gone along. Yeah, I'm I'm really proud of Malik. Um, I, I said this in an interview after the game the other night. Uh, I'm not sure if he's ever had a bad day in his life. You know, he's just a guy when he walks into the facility every day, exudes a, a, just a positive vibe. Um, and that has a way of rubbing off on on everyone in our program, coaches included. Um, and probably the best thing I've done is kind of gotten out of his way. You know, he has a little bit of Khalil Shabazz in him in terms of um, there may be a head scratching play or two that that happens, but um, need to learn to overlook some of those things because I think his body of work has a way of of kind of eliminating those plays. And he's really affected the game on both sides of the ball for us. 
uh, in a positive way. So I'm, I'm really proud of his progress. Um, a guy who did not, you know, have much success at his previous stop. And, and I think he's used that all as motivation. So uh, he's a really key piece for us going forward. Um, and I look forward to his continued development. Yeah, I mean, he's he I think it was must have been at some I forget exactly which game it was when he finally had like his 20 first 20 point game. And he just immediately like jumps off the off the screen when you see him play and just the way he's able to attack the basket and just just how has that changed the way you were able to kind of run the offense because of what he was able to bring? Yeah, just another guy who um, on any given night can be our leading scorer. And I think that's um, should be a separator for our team. You know, I think we have really good depth. Um, you know, we talk about a lot as a team that we have to be okay with, you know, one night it being Jonathan Mobo, one night it being Malik Thomas, one night it being Marcus Williams. Um, and you could go on and on down the list. Dueto Newberry's had a really good run here. So um, that's why I like our team. I think we have a lot of different weapons, uh, Malik being one of them, um, and has really contributed to, you know, the run that we've been on here late. And you talked about your depth and I would, I, th I would agree. Like, I think that your team probably may be the deepest in the WCC or at least like, as far as like usage goes, like you, you go deeper into your bench than maybe anyone else in the conference. And one of the guys not off the bench, but in your lineup now, Duido Newberry has just been playing so well as of late and just, you started to see nuggets of this last year and we're starting to really kind of see his almost like full development. Just kind of talk about like what he, what he's meant and just how he's grown throughout this year, because that we started to see it last year and now we're starting to really see his potential. Yeah. Uh, Duedo is, is so young, you know, when it comes to being a basketball player, he's a junior eligibility wise, but um, he started playing basketball late. Hasn't really had a lot of in-game experience. We, we burned a red shirt on him halfway through the season last year. Um, and so he, he's just kind of figuring it out as he goes along. And the more game minutes he plays, the better he gets. Um, and he's a guy who, again, I think he plays both sides of the ball really good defensively, helps cover up a lot of stuff for us, um, is now starting to shoot the ball at an extremely high clip, which I think is is been the next kind of uh, maturation of his game. Um, and just a guy who brings a, a level of toughness to our team and uh, versatile. That's why, you know, we have a lot of interchangeable parts, him, him being one of them. Yeah, that's the thing that really does seem like that just up and down this lineup is you have so many different options to go to and really and because after after I would say like Ryan Beasley and Marcus Williams, who are maybe on a little on the smaller side, you have a bunch of guys who are like six, seven, six, eight, and they just really you really are able to seem to like mix and match really kind of like as as needed. And that's obviously been a big key to how well you guys have been able to play defense and. And on that front, it's like obviously the guy like who's been in the middle of all of this and who has been played, who's been incredible all year long has been Jonathan Mobo. And he leads, I think it's right now, he leads the conference in scoring, leads the conference in rebounding, he leads the conference in shooting percentage. Like he is, he's kind of been Mr. Do It All because I feel like he's kind of fully exceeded the expectations of what you probably had going into the year. What What's your kind of been just how important has obviously he's been important, but just kind of speak to like everything that he's meant uh, this year for the team. Yeah. I mean, he's exceeded my expectations and I've had really high, me and my staff had extremely high expectations for him coming in. Um, probably the thing that is, is impressed me the most about him and kind of gets overlooked is, is his ability to facilitate, you know, and, and we can run offense through him. Um, and allow him to be the decision maker for us, uh, which is really unique, you know, and I think it, it mirrors some of the things you're seeing at the, the next level. You know, it's it's a lot of five out. It's a lot of positionless basketball. He just happens to be a so-called five man that we can initiate offense through and he can rebound and bring it on the break. And um, sometimes that's the best way into offense is when you have a guy who can really rebound and, and bring it. Um, but can't say enough about him. He Number one, he is um, as high of a character kid as I've been around uh, in my career. Um, 
has meshed really well in, in with the group, as has Malik and the rest of our transfers. And I think that's a, a, a huge reason why uh, we are where we are. And one of the one of the other additions that actually was a midseason addition was to the coaching staff, Frankie Ferrari making his return uh, to the Hilltop. And obviously, like he's been around the program like in and out for since he was here first time and second time. But kind of talk about like how that kind of occurred and then also just like what he's been able to how he's really helped out since he since he arrived officially. Yeah. Um so after I got the job I, I tried to get Frankie back in the mix here and he wasn't quite ready to hang him up yet. And so I'd always, you know, we stayed in touch and we exchanged texts and uh he was always here during the summertime and um I actually got a phone call from him the night before our scrimmage down at USC back in the fall and he expressed some interest and we just happened to have a spot available with Vinny McGee leaving to, to join the Lakers staff. Um, and I just thought it, it was too good to be true um, to get a guy who gave so much to the Hilltop uh, was one of the better point guards to, to come out of the conference in, in a long time. Um, so to have his kind of knowledge, his, his, um, his winning ways, uh, he's extremely competitive um, and he's won here and he knows what it what it takes to to be a successful point guard. So to be able to have him in practice every day with Ryan Beasley and Marcus Williams and uh, Mike Sharab jams, um, you know, it's invaluable and, and so happy and, and lucky uh, to have him back here on the hilltop. Yeah, it was fun to fun to watch him play and it's great to actually see him back back up there. And I think that's one of the things that's like in college programs across the board. It's like when you see some of the old players come back and uh, be part of it, it really kind of like validates what the program is doing, at least like the way that's the way I look at it. No, absolutely. Um, so looking at, looking ahead that, again, uh, right before we hopped on, we talked about like the last six have bit one, six in a row. It's been a little bit of like not the best of opponents and whatnot. Now you come into a week where you have LMU and St. Mary's coming in. Uh, you've been you've defended the home court well nine and zero to this point, and this these two games seem like that they're going to be much closer than a lot of the games you've obviously had recently. Um, for these two games, and maybe you haven't looked too far into St. Mary's because you have LMU next, but look looking at the, this week. What what's kind of like the initial message to the guys as far as like the, the focus that needs to happen? Because these are two teams that are obviously very capable. St. Mary's obviously of winning the league, but LMU is capable of beating anybody on any night. Yeah. Um, you know, the message for our team isn't going to change. I think it's 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 been a, a good thing for us. A good recipe for us to this point is just trying to stay extremely, extremely short sighted. Um, and not worrying about something that's going to happen on down the line. Um, just staying focused on what's next. And what's next for us is, number one, we need to get better on some fronts, you know, for us uh, individually, for us personally as a team. Um, and then we'll get into our prep for, for LMU um, and get ready for that game on Thursday night. Um, you know, I have all the respect in the world for Stan Johnson, what he's done down there. Uh, extremely well-coached team. They're big. Uh, they play hard, um, and so we know we're going to have our hands full on on Thursday night, and we want to get through Thursday, and we'll we'll you know we'll turn the page and and focus in on what comes next after that. And and just I mean thinking about the big picture, and I don't know how how much you can you worry about the big picture. Obviously, the guys are focused on the next game and really really focused on that. But the fact that like you've you have set yourself up really well. It seems that to potentially have like be at least in the conversation for like an at large. And I know like it's where it's, I mean, net 42 as of this morning, Kemp, Kemp Palm is 52. So it's a little bit on the outside kind of looking in, but with some of these wins, it's like you put yourself right back into that spot, right back in that conversation, especially if it's a win against a St. Mary's, which is going to count well, I think right now they're a Q2 or whatnot, but just thinking that through, it's like, how, how much do you start thinking about like that big picture? And, or again, like how much do you allow yourself to do that or the coaching staff allow themselves to do that? Yeah. I mean, we, we look at all that stuff on a, on a daily basis. And um, I know we can only control what we can con control, you know? And, and so we do have some opportunities on our schedule um, that will um, hopefully elevate us if we, we handle things on our end, but um, 
you know, we need to continue to just keep winning games, you know, and, and let the dust settle at the end of the day. I feel like we're flying under the radar a little bit, which is great. Um, I prefer to just stay there and allow our guys to focus on just getting ready to win basketball games. And um, we like where we're at. We're not satisfied with where we're at. All right, Coach, thanks for hopping on for a little bit, shouting some USF hoops. Um, LMU and St. Mary's this week, good luck um, in the two games, and uh, we'll definitely catch up later. Appreciate it. Thanks, Zach. So, again, USF taking on LMU, St. Mary's this week. It'll be a big – it's a big week for the Dons. It really is like that – that's the team to watch this week because – if they can set themselves up, if they somehow come out of this week five and zero in WCC play, they again we're kind of move. It keeps moving of like who's in the driver's seat, who's in the driver's seat because it really has become game to game. It was Santa Clara just on Thursday. Now it's St. Mary's. If USF gets this win, it could switch to them. It's it's really moving. It's a moving target on who could be the the team to beat in the WCC because right now it's like I it's still one of four teams at this stage. But uh, before, as I start to wrap up, I do want to make sure that I acknowledge uh, a, another streak that was snapped. And that was Pepperdine's 19-game losing streak was snapped on Saturday when they had a comeback win at San Diego, 83-77. San Diego led by as much as 15 in this game. And Pepperdine went on a... 17-0 run with six minutes left in this contest to get the win. Michael Ajayi, 24-12. He's been, again, continues to have a great season. Uh, Bobakar Koulibaly, he had a career-high 17 in that contest. Uh, Houston Millette with 23. Quietly, Pepperdine is now 2-2 two and two in conference play. And they're starting to play a little bit better than what we saw in the non-conference. Having Javon Porter back obviously is a huge component to that and the way they look. But it's going to be a tough week. Uh, they they have they are going to be home, but they started by hosting Gonzaga. And they're the first game after a Gonzaga loss. So good luck to the Waves. And also they are going to be hosting LMU. So a couple of really tough matchups. I this, I feel like that they snapped this one just in time because it feels like there's going to be a rough week uh, for the Waves. And then another team just to watch for this week uh, is going to be Santa Clara because I it's important and I think critical to see how they rebound after a very emotional week. The ups and downs of what they had to go through. The ups of beating Gonzaga and the downs of losing to St. Mary's the way they lost to St. Mary's. Uh, they This week, they'll have be at Pacific, and then they're going to be back home for Portland. So two good teams for them to to kind of get get right with and before they start to see some of their tougher opponents as they go along. Uh, they are still a few weeks out from seeing St. Mary's again. That'll be, I believe, the last week of January. All right. One more time, I want to thank uh, my guests, both head coach Chris Gerlefson and also Connor Hope, who was on the podcast, who was on the pod live version of the podcast on Thursday. Be sure to go and rewatch that if you want to see the whole thing. Uh, be sure to subscribe here on the YouTube channel. Also, be able to follow on social media at Post by Zach on Twitter. Also, at Unoff WCC Pod. Be sure to follow along there as well. All right, well, that'll do it for this week. Exciting basketball. USF's the team to watch this week. Santa Clara also kind of minor to keep an eye on them. Uh, and that will, that'll do it. Thanks for watching, and I will catch you later. Mm -hmm.